Ah, uh, the old weapon drop and catch. The most cliched move in modern fight scenes. Also the most easily predictable and often the worst choreographed. We've all seen fight scenes that have tried it out, that failed miserably for one reason or another. But does the weapon drop have to be predictable? Does it have to have a slow motion in the same spot every time? How do you do it without somebody becoming a statue and letting it happen? Wouldn't it be great if there was some sort of checklist that you could follow to guide you through choreographing a weapon drop of your own? Well. Welcome to the Weapon Drop Checklist. First, who's holding whom? This is the single most important thing in making a weapon drop not look stupid. Which hand is grabbing which wrist? Who's got free hands? If there's a free hand, it must be doing something worthwhile, at least worthwhile in the mind of the character. If someone can save their life by letting go, they must have a good reason not to do that. So you really have to pay attention to who has the ability to let go and why they don't. If there isn't a compelling reason for them to not let go, then you have to change the original Pose. Yes, I know that this weapon disappears, but that doesn't matter for this. Ray is using her hand to stop the Praetorian Guard from slitting her throat with his weapon. Then when she does the weapon drop, she has to move her hand that's saving her own life. So when she drops it and moves her hand, there is no reason for the guard to not kill her. That's obviously something we need to avoid. We need to make it so that when the character drops their weapon and catches it, they're not open to be killed. So when she moves her hand, the Praetorian Guard is also free to move. The way Ray does this would only work against a statue, which is essentially what the guard has to become in the film. What's also important is the Praetorian Guards are famously good fighters. It's out of character for a Praetorian Guard to just stop moving and become a statue. It's out of character for this little thing to defeat them. That's not to say that you couldn't do this successfully against a Praetorian Guard, but you have to set it up in a way that makes it okay and believable for the guard to fall for it. Ray has never been grabbed and put in some sort of grappling position in this fight or any other fight, so it really feels like they only choreographed the grab so that they could do this weapon drop. You don't want it to feel for the audience like the good guy had a move and you thought, okay, let's just get something that the bad guy does to give us an excuse to do that move. The person who wins the fight needs to use that move for a reason, and the person who loses that fight needs to have gotten into that position to begin with for a reason. The reason of so that we can do the weapon drop isn't good enough. In Game of Thrones, Arya Stark uses this move to defeat the Night King, but the Night King, like a Praetorian guard, basically just becomes a statue and watches it happen. This is a cool shot, I like the framing, but you see his eye watch the knife, and even in this shot you see his head lean forward, he literally just watches himself die. And the thing is, we can't say that the Night King is too slow, that Arya is too fast and too sneaky for him, because the Night King was perceptive enough to know that she was coming up behind him, and fast enough to completely turn around Around, grab her throat and the stabbing arm. That takes some precision right there. So he is obviously fast enough to do anything about this happening. But most importantly here, who's doing the grabbing? The Night King is grabbing Arya's arm and he's also grabbing her neck. He's doing all of the grabbing, which means he's the one with free hands essentially. As soon as she drops the knife, he has the power to get out of that position. He has all of the power to let go with either hand or both hands and doesn't. The person who gets stabbed or hit can't can't lose because of a massive stupid mistake that's out of character, or else the audience will feel unsatisfied, like the movie cheated, like the character didn't really win. And if the character didn't really win, then they didn't really accomplish their goal. It could make the whole movie unsatisfying. The person doing the weapon drop can't be caught in that position because of a massive stupid mistake on their part. Like Arya Stark screaming as she jumps in to attack. That's completely out of character and just a massive stupid mistake that everybody hated. It's also not in character for the Night King, who seems to be destined to take over the entire planet as this warlord. It's not in character for him to fall for it, or to be so easily defeated. Both Game of Thrones and Star Wars The Last Jedi use slow motions to really slow down the moment and try to make it feel more dramatic. Unfortunately, what this does with this move is usually just make it seem really predictable, especially if you slow things down before the actual weapon is dropped. Now we're spending the whole time watching it happen. We're watching the Night King die or the Praetorian Guard die, wondering why they aren't moving when the whole time we're thinking, okay, move, okay, move, okay, move. Personally, I'm not a fan of using an isolated shot of the weapon being caught because it slows things down too much. It gives the audience too much time to predict what's going to happen, which I 
don't like. But this isn't about camera moves, this video is more about the actual fight choreography, so we're gonna gloss over camera movement for this video. Here's Far Cry 3 and Voss getting killed. He blocks the knife, and he's got a free hand. Both characters have a free hand, so when the protagonist drops the knife, Voss can catch it just as easily as the protagonist. He can do anything, but he doesn't. He just stands there. An important note though is where Voss is looking. Where your characters look tells the audience where to look. So while he's looking at the knife, it looks like he's not thinking of doing anything. He's not looking at the protagonist. He's not looking for something to grab. He's not looking for an opening to strike. He's just staring at the knife and holding it there. The pose is just being held. And well, since we're looking at the knife in its first person point of view, everybody's just staring at the knife, which means we're all just waiting for something to happen with the knife. So even if the moves in the choreography don't make the next move predictable, where your characters are looking is something that needs to be taken into consideration as part of the choreography, because where they're looking tells the audience what's coming next or tells them where to look. If you want the audience to feel that this was a sly, clever move by the character they're cheering for, you need to make the audience look somewhere else so that when it happens, they're surprised and they think, oh, that was cool, I actually didn't see that coming. In the show Titans, Deathstroke has a fight with Wonder Girl, and this is where we're going to talk about establishing a pattern for the moves that they do. From the point where they lose their weapons, every single thing they throw lands. There are no blocks in this whole section of the fight until she blocks the knife that he pulls in. At least they didn't do the weapon drop on this first block because then it would have felt like the only reason they did a block was so that the weapon drop could happen. But it really kind of is the only reason it happens because while this spot isn't where the weapon drop happens, it's the very next move, which is also a block. It would have felt less predictable if Wonder Girl had blocked at least a couple of times, maybe grabbed a couple of times, but 100% of the moves they were throwing landed and all of a sudden blocks are introduced so that they can have one block happen and do the weapon drop move. Establishing a pattern of blocks before that one specifically happens, especially a pattern of blocks happening in that manner, really helps to hide the weapon drop from the audience. And the more you catch the audience off guard, the more they see it as a wow moment, not a, uh, oh, they did that thing kind of moment. In my opinion, they're holding the moment of the block for too long too. The more time you hold a position, the more time the audience has to think about what's going to happen next. They're naturally wanting to see what happens next and their brain is going to start predicting. Since the weapon drop is such a cliched move at this point, it's probably the first thing an audience member is going to predict is going to happen when a block like this happens and is held for too long. Take note of who's holding what. Wonder Girl is holding the arm with the knife, so Deathstroke does need to do something. Dropping it makes sense for him to be able to use the knife, but the hand he catches it with is being held by Wonder Girl. So in order for him to get it, she has to just let go or hold his arm in place but let him move it around freely? It doesn't make sense that he's able to move his other arm to catch it because Wonder Girl is in complete control of where that arm is. What I do like about this fight is that she uses an X block which uses two arms to block the knife and then pays the price for it by getting her wound squeezed. So the next time she blocks, she does it with only one arm. This shows adaptation and intelligence in the character which is fantastic. She did one thing and it worked for blocking the knife, but didn't work for keeping her safe. So the next time she blocks the knife, she does it a different way. In Batman The Enemy Within, from the Telltale series, the Joker fights Selina and does the same weapon drop and slashes her in the leg. I appreciate that with the Joker it's important to show this insert shot of how much he's enjoying this, even though he just got punched in the face. I said we were going to ignore camera movement for the most part, but I do need to point this out. Yeah, we cut away from a wider shot and show him laughing, but then when we come back, we come back to just the knife and two hands, so it's obvious what's going to happen. It is very very in character for the Joker to do this kind of thing because the weapon drop is basically a trick. This is probably one of the Joker's moves that he enjoys falling back on, is letting somebody block the knife strike so that he can drop it and slash them. Maybe he's laughing because he got punched in the face, but maybe he's laughing because he has successfully set up this move. What does suck about this though is she grabs the knife hand and then punches him in the face and then what does she do with her free hand? She just stops. She stops punching him, she doesn't try to move, she doesn't do anything with the hand that she's grabbed, she just kind of pulls her hand way back behind her so that the Joker has ample time and opportunity to do this. In order to pull off a weapon drop successfully, it has to happen without the protagonist making some sort of massive, obvious mistake, or standing still and becoming a statue. And how do we do that? Well, let's find out how we do that. 
So here's my fight choreography in a stage production of Mercutio and his brother Valentine, a Canadian play. These characters are doing a best two out of three sparring session. Valentine just scored his second point and has shown so far that he is the better swordsman. We can't have Mercutio be so good that it doesn't make sense for him to be killed by Tybalt. We need him to succeed in this fight because that's what the script calls for. But we also need him to win in a way that doesn't make it unbelievable for Tybalt to best him later on in the play. Now there's stuff we need to establish. First, we need to establish a pattern. And establishing a pattern is how we're going to make the audience not see the sword drop coming, but also how we're going to make it believable to the audience that Mercutio wins this fight. This is rehearsal, so not everything is timed the way it will be in the actual performance. They've still got a little work to do, and that's fine. But they were told that when this hit and block happens, to hold it for just a beat. This is happening at the beginning of this section of the fight. Not not later on, not right before the weapon drop. This gives the audience a clear image at the beginning so that when the fight ends, there's a feeling of connectivity from the beginning and the ending of the fight. Valentine switches the grip on his sword. We're making a pattern of him being able to switch grips with the sword to try something different. One thing the actors had to work around, which they did a great job of, is you can see the actor Rob Elliott hits his sword on the platform here, and that's a part of it being narrower than we expected on either side of the platform. So that's why it looks like he's too late getting up there. But after some rehearsals and during the shows, it always went off without a hitch. And every time you did it, it was fast and accurate. And now where are we? We've got the same visual of the position we had at the beginning of this section of the fight. Remember this part here? But this is one too many times for Valentine to go for that grab. We've established a pattern of him wanting to grab. He's always trying to grab and create his own openings. But when he does it one too many times, and it should feel to the audience like, we know he's gonna grab, this shouldn't work. It doesn't work. He still goes for the grab. And when he does, we don't get a grab and then a pause. We get, as that grab happens, immediately Mercutio drops the sword. Mercutio knows what's coming because there's been too much of a predictable pattern now. Draw out the right moment. Don't draw out the moment of the weapon falling. The longer it takes to fall, the more time it feels like there is for the opponent to counter it. The last thing you want is for the person to win the fight, but then for the audience to feel like they didn't really win. It was more that you cheated as a filmmaker because the script said they were supposed to win. Instead, let the fall happen at speed and draw out the moment of consequences. By drawing out the moment after the weapon falls, you give the audience time to catch up to the action and be wowed and emphasize a moment of triumph rather than a moment of waiting to see if there's gonna be a counter. I am using the skill tree technique because Mercutio has had his arm grabbed multiple times in the fight, but every time he's done something to counter it, it hasn't led to a point. It's been more of a defensive move. So I'm able to show the sly intelligence of Mercutio compared to Valentine, who is a very academic character. Suspicion of a move that's inconsistent with the rest of the fight is a major reason weapon drop seems so predictable. A couple of things that I did that you don't need to do to have a good weapon drop, but that I think really help sell it and elevate it to the next level. Valentine doesn't grab the arm and hold it still where it is. He's not gentle about it. He grabs the arm roughly and moves it up into the air. You can clearly see that he's trying to create an opening. This is difficult to do and does require some practice because if the actor playing Mercutio doesn't time his drop right, it'll affect the trajectory of the sword and it might be difficult for him to catch. However, all he has to make sure to do is drop the weapon before his wrist is grabbed. And this actor managed to do it correctly every single night. But what's Valentine doing? He goes for the grab and he's doing his own thing. He's switching grips. His movement to go from a regular grip to a reverse grip is the reason he doesn't strike Mercutio and win. It's the reason he's not faster. It's the reason there is that little blip of time for Mercutio to pull this off. And it's important to have that excuse. Since there's no pause at the grab, Valentine doesn't have the opportunity to let go of Mercutio's arm and do something else with that hand. By the time he would do that, the weapon drop has already happened and hit him. He's actively doing something the whole time. He's lunging in, moving his arm, and switching the sword grip all at the same time. So when the audience is watching the things Valentine's doing, expecting him to do the next move, and it turns out that Mercutio is the one doing the next move and he gets it, it seems that much faster. Look at these lines for this final position. 
If you think the checklist worked and you want it for yourself, I put a link to my own checklist in the description, so go ahead and download it. And it's more than just the list, I also expand on some of the ideas. If you want to learn more about the skill tree technique, click this video here. And if you didn't notice all of the gorgeous parallel lines in the final position of the fight scene, then you need to check out this video about using lines in fight scenes to create a sense of aesthetic beauty.